Brown Marsh once again. Good to have you here with us. And uh, as I said, the 17th is a big day. It is. Uh, and we talk about that. But let, let, And I asked you a question before the break. I'm going to come back to it. But talk, mm -hmm. talk to us about the 17th. Well, Senator Byrd, the late Senator Byrd, decided that we had gotten away as a country from the Constitution, from our roots, from something that actually brings us all together. And so he decided that we should have a Constitution Day. There was already a Citizenship Day. So he added the two together, and that's why September 17th is Constitution and Citizenship Day. And as you pointed out before, September 17th, 1787, is the date the Constitution was signed. Mm. So we talked about, Ed, before the break, I asked you a question. What does the Constitution particularly mean for us as a people? And uh, I gave you about a whole commercial break to think about <laughs> it, and then come back and respond. Well, I teach constitutional law at John Jay College. And what I try to do with my students is to have them see how relevant the Constitution is in everything that we do first and foremost everyone who sets foot on on US soil has equal protection rights you don't have to be a citizen you could be visiting you could be here for five seconds and you are protected by our Constitution that's important and not every country has it mm -hmm. also we should know as a community that you can trace our evolution through the Constitution there are more references to people of African descent in the US Constitution than any other people and that's what I pointed out and that's why I had this annotated Constitution put together so that it has footnotes it describes where we are in the Constitution and just like the three-fifths rule People know it exists, but they don't know where it is. Right. So that's why it's important for us to know about the Constitution. And thirdly, it's important because we set the ground rules for every other group that's been oppressed in this country. They learn from what we do. They follow our lead. They use our structures and they use our Supreme Court cases for their gay rights, women rights, disability rights, all of these things. And so that's why we need to understand we were in the forefront of this civil rights movement and that we are leaders. And that's in looking at the Constitution gives us a better sense of our leadership. Let's look a little bit at the Constitution and talk about some of the black presence within the Constitution as we as we know it to be. We know about the three fifths rule. Uh, let's talk about where someone can find that and what exactly does that mean? The three fifths rule is an Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution. And a three-fifths rule basically states that when the population is counted, we just had the census this year. Mm -hmm. Every 10 years we have a census. When they counted the population during the time of slavery, enslaved Africans were counted as only three-fifths of a person. For And that's, remember, we just had an election today, mm -hmm. primary election. That means that they would only be counted as three-fifths of a person to decide how many U.S. representatives would come from that state to U.S. Congress. The South wanted slaves to be counted as one person. The North wanted them to be counted as no people because the power of the politic is in the number in the population. That's why everybody should be a part of the census. And so the compromise was three-fifths of a person. That's a compromise between the North and South. Hmm. Where else can we find in, uh, a little bit more about our presence within uh, the Constitution? We know about three-fifths. Where else? Well, there's a Fugitive Slave Act in the Constitution. We didn't know that in this Constitution that we export all around the world to tell other countries you should have a Constitution like ours, that we actually have the evidence of a sl fugitive slave provision within our Constitution. And that fugitive slave provision was put in there and it was part of Article 4 of the Constitution because they wanted the framers, when they met in 1787, wanted to assure the slaveholders that if their property ran away to the north, that they could be brought back and then still owned by those slaveholders. So they wanted to assure those framers of the Constitution who were at the Constitutional Convention that their property would be safe with this new structure of government that, w that we decided on that year. Mm -hmm. Slavery was tied to a lot of the Constitution. Talking about the three-fifths rule, talking about what we just talked about here. Uh, Amendment number 13, dealing with the whole issue of having slavery abolished. Uh, share with us a little bit about the 13th Amendment and how historical that was. Well, it had some groundwork. The framers, when they decided that they could no longer have slavery, they knew in 1787 that one day slavery would have to end, mm -hmm. but they wanted it to end gradually. Remember, those slaveholders were very powerful people in the South, and there were slaveholders in the North as well. There were slaves in New York, as we know, when we have the, um, the, the slave graveyard, and there was slavery in New Jersey and other places. So in order to appease them, they would gradually phase out slavery. So they decided that they would have an Article I, Section 9, 
1869, the abolishment of the import and export of slaves in 1808. Mm -hmm. That led the groundwork, and it, it led the groundwork for the 1808 abolishment of slavery, so that by the time slavery was abolished altogether by the 13th Amendment, something had already been put in place to make these slaveholders realize that they would have to go into another line of work. And so by the 13th Amendment, unfortunately, we have a great compromise. Yes, it abolished slavery, mm -hmm. but abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime. Yes, and mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I'll quote, yes. neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Mm. So here we have, yes, people need to understand, and this is the language that remains today. So here's what they decided. We're going to let you be free, but we're going to use a criminal justice system to keep an eye on you. Then they decided they would have all of these criminal laws and these criminal laws for trespassing, loitering, and other things would then lock up these newly freed Africans, and then they could use their labor for free through the criminal justice system. Now, with this being here the way that it is, it, it, it seems to be pretty self-explanatory. I guess the question that would be to most people ask right now is, listen, you know, you, you just explained this pretty eloquently. Why haven't we made any adjustments, or why haven't we made enough noise to getting this whole thing fixed the way that it should be? Why? Because they decided through constitutional law cases that they said, well, hmm, slavery means free labor. Why don't we pay them 10 cents a day to do the labor within the prisons? Then it's not slavery. Yes, so that's why you have okay. people who are prisoners who are making 10 cents a day. As long as they're being paid something, then it's not slave labor. Wow, amazing, you can learn a whole lot. Can earn a little lot. What else would you like to bring to our attention that maybe we're not so familiar with through the Constitution? Well, something that's a major controversy right now. You have a number of conservatives who want to amend the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. The 14th Amendment gave many things to the newly freed Africans. Remember, the 13th Amendment in 1865 abolished slavery. But because of the Dred Scott decision in 1857, they had no rights because the U.S. Supreme Court said you have no rights a white man need respect. So they had to give them rights, and that's what the 14th Amendment does. It gives the rights of equal protection, due process, privileges and immunities. It gives all of these rights, and it also gives them citizenship at birth. That's the major issue now with immigration. Right. There are certain conservatives who say people are just coming in this country to have babies so they can be automatic citizens. Not every country allows people to have citizenship at birth. So what was created by the 14th Amendment in 1868 just for those newly freed Africans have now been expanded. Those rights have expanded to everyone. So now we know that anybody who's literally born at birth, uh, you know, here in the United States is actually a citizen of, of, the, of, the, United, of, of the, the United, United States. States. We talk about this here, particularly with the case of Arizona. And I guess the question is, do we really think that this is going to be revisited to the place that there could be a, an overturning? just to uh, specifically deal with the whole Arizona issue? Well, it's very difficult to change the Constitution. There are only 27 amendments, and this is from the time of, of 1789 when it was ratified. There have only been 27 amendments in all of this time, so it's very difficult. But the idea that someone would want to change it means that all these other groups that have come here and become citizens at birth, now all of a sudden they're saying we don't want any more people coming here specifically to become citizens at birth, especially these particular people of color. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's interesting that Africans were the reason why we have the 14th Amendment, and now people who are not African want to turn around and make other people of color non-citizens based on the same thing. It takes three-fifths, well, it takes two-thirds of the, the Congress to amend the Constitution. It really doesn't happen. And then it takes two-thirds or three-fifths, depending on how it works, um, of the state legislators to actually vote on that amendment and pass it as well. So if something starts off in the states, then the states have to let, have, legislatures have to amend their constitutions and vote for it, and then the um, federal constitution to be amended has to have the U.S. Congress amend it as well. So you have the states as well as the federal government all voting to have that one amendment to the U.S. Constitution.